Hi everyone, I'm Audrey Wack and this is Painting Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In this project, I wanted to adapt a science fiction novel into a picture book. Um, I chose this novel in particular because I find it highly humorous and packed with really exciting imagery that inspired me to make some pieces of artwork. In it, the Earth is destroyed and um, that is followed by a series of wacky adventures in space. And also pertinent to the book is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a traveler's guide slash encyclopedia that describes most of the galaxy. Uh, to start off my process, I read the book and did a series of images um, in, in sketches throughout the process of that. And as you can see that here, I also wrote down the specific prose from the novel that I used to inspire um, the different images. While my initial plan was to do the entire project using um, oil on canvas pieces, I found that the process an interesting way of making acrylic prints that I really enjoyed and ended up doing uh, parallel images for each of my oil paintings. Um, to make these, I would uh, make a layer of thick ac black acrylic paint, turn my brush around and scratch out my sketch onto the watercolor page and stamp it onto another one. This allowed me to play with the timing of the process of making my works and forced me to work more decisively as the paint would dry very quickly, so I had to make them fast. Another reason why I really love this book is all the small asides, often from the Hitchhiker's Guide, that play into the novel in different humorous and image-packed ways. Um, for instance, this piece has uh, some accompanying text. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy also mentions alcohol. It says that the best drink in existence is the pan-galactic garble blaster. The effect is like having your brain smashed out by a slice of lemon wrapped around a large gold brick. And as you can see here, I have my piece um, oil on canvas next to its adjoining print, which is in reverse because of that process. Um, another moment like that is accompanied by this text. Against all probability, a sperm whale had suddenly been called into existence several miles above the surface of an alien planet. This poor, innocent creature had very little time to come to terms with its identity as a whale, asking questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What's this thing suddenly coming towards me very fast? I wonder if it will be friends with me. Curiously enough, the only thing that went through the mind of the bowl of petunias as it fell was, oh no, not again. Many people have speculated that if we knew exactly why the bowl of petunias had thought that, we would know a lot more about why about the nature of the universe than we do now. And as you can see, I made um, many different iterations of this uh, using different materials, including oil on canvas, acrylic on canvas, and watercolor, as well as the print. Um, now I would kind of like to take you through the format in which I was hoping that my pieces would all come together. And that is actually going through the story of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. As I um, read this text, which is a combination of my writing and paraphrasing of the book, as long as some direct, uh, along with direct quotes, um, you will be able to see my oil paintings and um, parallel track of acrylic prints. Uh, this piece is my title page and it is actually a collage. Here you can see the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that has the reassuring words, don't panic on the cover. Earth was destroyed to make way for a bypass. This is minor and the Earthlings should not have been surprised. All of the planning charts and demolition orders have been on display in the planning department of Alpha Centauri for 50 Earth years. However, much more interesting was the theft of the heart of gold. This spacecraft was 150 meters long, shaped like a sleek running shoe, perfectly white and mind bogglingly beautiful. The president of the galaxy, Zaphod Beeblebrox, could not help but steal it. An earthling named Arthur Dent was just getting over the destruction of his home in order to make way for a bypass when he found out that his friend Ford Perfect was an alien and that Earth would be destroyed. Fortunately, they don't die as the Earth is destroyed and are pulled aboard an alien spacecraft. However, unfortunately, this spacecraft was a Vogon spacecraft and they merely were pulled aboard by the servant species Dentrasi who enjoyed irritating the Vogons. Vogons are thoroughly vile and hate hitchhikers. Their highly domed noses sat atop their small piggy foreheads and they ate jeweled crabs, smashing them with iron mallets. They would catch gazelle-like creatures with silken coats and dewy eyes to sit on, but they were no use for transport because their backs would snap instantly. While hiding on the ship, Ford put a babblefish into Arthur's ear. The Hitchhiker's Guide describes a babblefish. It is small, yellow, and leech-like, and probably the oddest thing in the universe. It feeds on brainwave energy received not from its own character, but those around it. 
It absorbs all unconscious mental frequencies from this brainwave energy to nourish itself with. It then excretes into the mind of a carrier, a telepathic matrix formed by combining the conscious thought frequencies with the nerve signals picked up from the speech centers of the brain, which has supplied them. The practical upshot of all this is that if you stick a babble fish in your ear, you can instantly understand anything said to you in any form of language. Arthur was wondering what the guide had to say about Earth. What? Harmless? Is that all it's got to say? I hope you managed to rectify that a bit, he said to Ford. It is important to note that Arthur's friend Ford was a hitchhiker involved in finding new information for the guide. Ford replied, uh, well, yeah, I managed to transmit a new entry off to the editor, but he had to trim it a bit. Now it says, mostly harmless. Unfortunately, the Bogans found Arthur and Ford in the ship, and they were not happy. They even decided to read them some poetry. Bogan poetry, of course, is the third worst in the universe. The prisoners sat in the poetry appreciation chairs, strapped in. The Bogans suffered no illusions as to the regards their works were generally held in. Arthur and Ford whiffed and sweated in pain as the poetry was read. When asked what they thought of the poetry, Arthur tried to pretend he enjoyed it and found a deeper meaning. The Bogan replied, so what you're telling me is that I write poetry because underneath my mean, callous, heartless exterior, I really just want to be loved? No, you're completely wrong. I just write poetry to throw my mean, callous, heartless exterior into sharp relief. I'm going to throw you off the ship anyway. Guard! A slight hiss built into a deafening roar of rushing air as the outer hatchway opened onto an empty blackness studded with tiny, impossibly bright points of light. Ford and Arthur popped into outer space like corks from a toy gun. A sensible voice began to read off highly improbable probabilities. A million-gallon vat of custard upended itself over them without warning. Bulges appeared in the fabric of space-time, great ugly bulges. Ah, oh, said Arthur as he felt his body softening and bending in unusual directions. My legs are drifting off into the sunset. My arms come off too. Ford, you're turning into a penguin. Stop it. On board the Heart of Gold, Zaphod and his earthling companion Trillian prepared for the guests they saved from space. They sent Marvin down to retrieve them. Marvin is a depressed robot. Arthur and Ford, meanwhile, were reading a brochure they had found on the ship. All the doors in this spaceship have a cheery and sunny disposition, it read. Marvin was particularly irritated by these doors. When he arrives, Marvin says, here I am, writing the size of a planet, and they ask me to take you down to the bridge. Call that jobs satisfaction? Because I don't. Let's build robots with general and people personalities, they said. So they tried it out on me. I'm a personality prototype. You can tell, can't you? Over the course of their travels, they realize that Zaphod wants to go to the legendary planet Margothea, a planet that builds planets, it is the most improbable planet of all. The screen was completely black, then a, bla then a vast crescent sliced into the corner of the picture, a red glare shading away into deep black, the night side of a planet. I found it, cried Zaphod. The ship gets attacked by a series of missiles, but they make it to the planet's surface. Remember that whale and bowl of petunias from earlier? Most of the travels travelers go down under the surface of the planet into the crater made by the whale's body, but Arthur meets a new person, Slarty Bartfast. He was tallish, elderly, and dressed in a long gray robe. In my air car, said the old man, motioning Arthur to get in the aircraft, which had settled silently next to them. We are going deep into the bowels of the planet, where even now our race is being revived from its five million year slumber. Slumber. Margothea awakes. It went to sleep to wait out the economic recession. We are about to pass through a gateway into a vast tract of hypersaste. It may disturb you. It scares the willies out of me. The car shot forward straight into the circle of light, and suddenly Arthur had a fairly clear idea of what infinity looked like. It wasn't in infinity, in fact. Infinity itself looks flat and uninteresting. The chamber into which the air car emerged was anything but infinite. It was just very, very big, so it gave the impression of infinity far better than infinity itself. The wall. The wall defied imagination, seduced it, and defeated it. The wall was so paralyzingly vast and sheer that its top, bottom, and sides passed away beyond the reach of sight. The mere shock of vertigo could kill a man. Ranged away before them, at distances he could neither judge nor even guess at, were a series of curious suspensions, shadowy spherical um, shapes that hung in space. But they were not reopening the whole business yet. They had a very special commission, one that might interest Arthur. It, it was indeed the only one of many structures that betrayed any sign of activity about it. Earth Mark II. Earthman, the planet you lived on, was commissioned, paid for, and run by mice. It was destroyed minutes before the completion of the purpose for which it was built, and we've got to build another one. The Earth was, in fact, built in order to find the question to the meaning of life, after the answer was deemed to be the largely non-explanatory answer, 42. Next, the air car brought them to a house where Arthur was reunited with four trillion and Zaphod. Arthur notices the mice on the table and screams, but then it is discovered that these mice were the searchers to the question to the meaning of life. They looked at Slarty Bartfast. It looks very much as if we won't be needing the new Earth any longer. Not now that we have found a native of the planet who was there seconds before it was destroyed. Now, 
earth creature. The situation we have in effect is this. We have, as you know, been more or less running the, your planet for the last 10 million years in order to find the answer to the ultimate question. Your brain was an organic part of the penultimate configuration of the computer program. There's a good chance that the structure of the question is encoded in the structure of your brain. So we want to buy it off you. With a tiny roaring shriek, their two glass transports lifted themselves off the table and swung in the air towards Arthur. But I won't spoil the rest of the story. And I would like to thank my wonderful mentor, uh, Professor Richard Razeless, who is a prolific artist and also has been an instructor and professor of fine arts for over 30 years, as well as several other, other professors in the CFA who supported my work and the Killershawn Honors Project for uh, the Killershawn Honors College for supporting this project as well. Any questions?